Good morning, Trinity Lutheran. It is great to be with you this morning. I certainly wish we were together in person. And those days are coming again. And I think they're coming again very soon. Um, I do want to take a moment uh, to thank uh, all of you for the uh, prayers as uh, Jolene and I have been um, recovering from uh, COVID and Jolene's a day or two ahead of me. Uh, and today is actually the very first day that I've even felt like getting on the computer uh, to be able to deliver this message. So God is good. He uh, does everything in his timing. Uh, Jolene is actually off quarantine now and uh, I will be on quarantine for yet two more days. And, uh, but I do thank you so very much for all of your prayers. Um, what we're going to do today is I just want to make sure that, uh, uh, that you hear the word. Uh, so we're just going to do a couple of the readings and uh, uh, I'll deliver a sermon and then we're going to go into prayer, the prayers of the, of the day. And uh, next week, God willing, we'll be able to have a, a much fuller service for you. Um, but let's begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our first reading uh, for this morning is from the uh, book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 7. This is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live, live as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as they were, though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no goods. And those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife, and his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be in how to be holy in body and spirit, but the married woman is anxious about the worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. Our gospel reading this morning will be from the book of Mark, chapter 1. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of the Lord and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Passing along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother, brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat, mending the nets. And immediately he called them. And they left their father, Zebedee, in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. Repent and believe in the gospel. Our focus for this morning is... Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. As we begin this morning, let's come together in prayer. Gracious Father, we thank you that you have given us your word. That word announces that the kingdom of God is at hand. It is a hope-filled statement that is as applicable to us today as it was to those whom Jesus proclaimed the words. And still we confess, we wonder, when will we see this kingdom? When will we get to taste of that great wedding feast with Christ and all of the saints in the church? As we look at these words this morning, we ask that you would open our ears to hear of their promises given for us. By the power of your Holy Spirit, cause us to know and to, to believe your gospel promises given to us so freely. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, our Lord and our rock. Amen. 
grace and peace to you from God the Father and from our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As of last Wednesday, we officially have a new president. Whether we agree with the policies of Mr. Biden or disagree with them, he's now our president. And we are to pray for him and for his administration. For those who might question this statement, hear the words of it given to us in the scripture in 1 Timothy chapter 2. I urge them, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intersections, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. There you have it. <clears throat> According to the scriptures, we are to pray for the president, for the administration, and for all of our public servants. We pray that they would govern wisely and that we will be able to live peaceful and quiet lives. We pray for this because our experience has shown us that in recent history, events reveal that peace and quiet can tend to elude us. And it certainly was this way in the days of Jesus. We read, now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee. John the Baptist, as you may recall, was arrested on the orders of Herod Antipas. Herod and his wife Herodias, who was also his niece, by the way, and who also had been the wife of Herod's brother, Philip, I'll just try to sort that one out for a moment. See, both of these had a grudge against John. John's message was repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Herod and Herodias, and especially Herodias, were angered by this message because they were being told that their marriage too was something to be repented of. How dare anyone tell a king and a queen that they were sinners? Yet John pointed out the truth in his message, and he was killed for this message. And so Jesus comes into the same area where John had been arrested, the area of Herod Antipas' rule, and he comes proclaiming the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Well, through these words, you can pretty much see that the ministry of Jesus was not going to go smoothly for him. He is coming right into the area where John the Baptist has been preaching, preaching the same message as John, and that preaching had already cost John his life, or was going to cost John his life. But what is this kingdom of God? More accurately, these words could be translated from the Greek, the rule and the reign of God. So the more accurate translation of the verse is, the rule and reign of God has drawn near and is now at hand. The assertion of these words is that with the coming of Jesus, the rule and reign of God is bursting upon the scene. Everything has changed, and it is now still changing. Earthly kingdoms come and go. Earthly rulers come and go. And whether these rulers come into power through the peaceful means of democracy or through violence, they all have one thing in common, and that is that they do not have the authority to rule within themselves. Earthly rulers must receive the authority to rule from outside themselves. What I mean is that from the worldly viewpoint, rulers must have, they must have people, they must have land, they must have other resources in order to govern. The lands they rule sustain them. Earthly rulers must receive their earthly authority from the very empires, the kingdoms, or the countries that they rule. But it is also quite true, as stated in Romans 13, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. When Jesus proclaims the rule and reign of God has drawn near and is now at his hand, he is announcing a new order. The kingdom of heaven is different from worldly kingdoms because it does not rely on outside resources or people. Instead, God reigns, and it is his ruling which creates and sustains this kingdom. While presidents and kings depend on their nations and kingdoms to uphold their rule, the kingdom of God depends on God, its king. 
Not only does God's kingdom exist in a different way, but it has also revealed itself in a very different way. The kingdoms of this earth put on an extravagant show. Kings and presidents live in elegance and palaces and fortified houses. They have personal guards, they have servants, and they have throngs who surround them seeking to earn their favor. And they have abundant support staff. In these, this past week, we've seen the pomp and circumstance surrounding the inauguration of a new president. And though the celebrations have been curtailed by this COVID pandemic, still they were grand shows. But that is the way things are done here on Earth. Worldly kingdoms tend to do everything big. Worldly powers tend to reveal themselves in very public and very extravagant ways. They want to clearly show the world just who's in charge. The kingdom of God, however, reveals itself in a very different way. In the revelation of God's kingdom, most people saw just a man, the son of carpenter. We read in Mark chapter 6, is, not, is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and of Judah and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. Jesus had no servants. In fact, we are told in Mark chapter 10 that Jesus came to serve. Jesus had no palace. And, but when asked about his home, Jesus said in Matthew 8, 20, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. The kingdom of God is a, a rule and a reign of of paradoxes, seemingly absurd or self-contradictory statements or propositions. So much of God's kingdom is the exact opposite of what we would expect. There's a reason that the kingdom of God is so much different from the kingdom of the world. As Jesus told Pontius Pilate in John chapter 18, my kingdom is not of this world. Jesus did not come to rule but to submit. Jesus said the Son of Man has, has not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom to many. This king who rules over heaven and earth left his throne and he hid his glory and he joins his subjects here on earth. He took on human flesh. He suffered as we suffer. He was tempted to sin in every way as we are tempted. Yet Jesus did not sin. Why would Jesus join us here on earth? We read the answer in the letter to the Hebrews, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been empty or tempted as we are, yet without sin. Jesus Christ, even though he was sinless, he suffered the punishment and death of sin. The king of glory took on the sins of his subjects, yours and mine, and then he endured the punishment which was rightfully ours, and he did this so that you and I might have eternal life. Jesus Christ endured the punishment that his subjects deserved, and in exchange he gave them, that's you and me, his righteousness to take its place. We read in 1 Peter, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. When Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead, he opened the entrance to this kingdom. That way is now open, and it will remain open to the end of time. The proclamation of Jesus in today's gospel tells us how to enter his kingdom. The time is fulfilled, we read, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Today, we have been confronted by the truth. There is no more waiting. God is on the scene in the person of Jesus Christ. And as he's staring you in the face, we are told to repent and believe in the gospel. 
Repentance, brothers and sisters, begins with confessions. We acknowledge our sin and our thought, our sinful nature to God. And then repentance asks God for the desire and the power to change our sinful ways. As we repent, we believe that God will remove our sin and our guilt for the sake of his son, Jesus Christ. And why do we believe this? We believe this because God's word is very plain in John, or 1 John. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It is those who repent and believe in the gospel who find themselves in God's kingdom even now. Those who do not believe cannot enter God's kingdom, thus they find themselves plunged into the darkness of hell. But what do we repent of? We find that answer in our reading for this morning from 1 Corinthians. We read the words of Paul. This is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none. And those who mourn as though they were not mourning. And those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing. And those who buy as though they had no goods. And those who deal with the world as though they had no dealing with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. Say what? You see, there are so many things which vie for our attention in this world. And so much of our focus on them instead of the king of kings. Retirement funds, entertainment, worldly relationships, all of our earthly toys and our activities and this toy list can go on and on. And these things are not bad, but for too many of us, these things have become the source of meaning and joys in our lives. These things, though important, have become our ultimate meaning in life. We are told that these things will pass away. And so many of us know firsthand the truth of this statement. To repent is to have that order corrected, to know and to live our lives as though the kingdom of God is at hand. See, in repentance, that kingdom becomes the ultimate thing in our lives. As I said, we cannot repent and believe in our own power. Even to repent and believe, which are the, the elementary actions of the Christian, are solely the work of the Holy Spirit within us. And they are a continuous, living, active part of our relationship with God. We sin every day. And so we repent every day. And every day, our Savior and King comforts us with the eternal truth that our sins have been and will be forgiven. Jesus said, the time is fulfilled. The, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. This is the message that Jesus passed on to his disciples when he made them to become fishers of men. This is the message that the church has proclaimed down through the centuries. And this is the message that the church, uh, that I proclaim to you today. Hear the word of the Lord, brothers and sisters in Christ. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. We, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Respond with, hear our prayer. Wise and good Father, help us to understand you as the source of all wisdom and not to lean on our own understanding. We praise your holy name for giving us the freedom to come to you through prayer in all matters and at all times. Your word is faithful and trustworthy. So let us be guided by your steadfast ways in all we do. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious Lord, you provide for all of our needs, both body and soul. 
Create in us grateful hearts to receive all that you provide and to praise you through meaningful worship together. Teach us to be more Christ-like in all that we do, that we may continue to build up your church for the sake of the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, you are a wise and generous God. We pray for the wisdom of our elected leaders in our community and state and country. We ask for your guidance and continued presence to be with them as they make decisions concerning your people. We also pray for the well-being of our leaders, that they would be of sound mind and body so that they do all, could do all their important work. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father God, you are alone the source of all comfort we pray for all those who are mourning or who are in pain or who are struggling with trials especially lord i lift up all of those who are suffering with the effects of covid i do ask that you be especially with the people of trinity who are battling this heal those who have been impacted we pray and comfort those who have suffered loss because of this pandemic be with all of the medical personnel, Lord, who minister through their vocations to the people. Be with our sister Eunice. Be with Roy and Joan. Be with Ed. Be, Lord, with Fred and Joanne and shower your mercies upon Joyce and Rebecca, Kirk and Stan. Be with Elaine and June, Rusty and Carol. Be with Judy and Laura. Rohini and Carter and Anne. Gracious Father, you've also placed so many others on our hearts as well. We lift them up at this time, Lord, before your throne of grace. Lord, may they gain strength in the knowledge of your promise of eternal life and know your abiding presence in the here and now. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands we commend for all for whom we pray, Almighty Father, trusting in your mercy and grace through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, forgive our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his peace. Take care, brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. <laughs>